Hello and welcome. I'm Rachel Marks, the Rezo Spark Network Network Coordinator. I'm a middle-aged white woman with chin-length purple hair. I'm wearing purple cat's eye glasses with sparkles in the corner, a purple top, and dangly silver earrings. Over my right shoulder is a white fireplace with a teal mantelpiece, and over my left is a white wall with a black chalkboard painted on it. My pronouns are she and her, and my sign name is this. Welcome to Spark Expert Chats. I'm joined by Mark Robinson and Fanny Martin. Today, we are meeting together from different parts of the province, in fact, the world, via technology that is steeped in the colonial mindset and that continues to marginalize and exclude many of our Indigenous communities. Communities who may not have access to reliable internet or the technology needed to access the internet. Last month, our chat was about digital equity, and I invite you to take a moment to think about the privilege that we are all experiencing right now in order to take part in this chat. As many of you know, I'm also a relaxed performance and disability arts consultant. I mention that as it's very much the subject of today's chat. So please take a moment, get comfy and relax, pause if you need to, and here we go. Uh, I'm just going to invite our guests to introduce themselves. Mark? Uh, hi, I'm Mark Robinson. Uh, I work as a writer and researcher and consultant under the name Thinking Practice. Um, and I am uh, beaming to you from the northeast of England, uh, from a place called Eaglescliff in Stockton on Tees um, uh, in the northeast uh, of England. Uh, I am a middle aged uh, white man with um, greying ginger hair swept back uh, and a, a, a ginger and white beard. The past and the future are neat in my beard. Um, uh, and in the background, you can, uh, there is a, a, a big set of bookshelves um, with um, mainly my poetry books and some music books and, a, uh, and a, a framed picture that says, this is not a library um, because it isn't, it's just my books. So I'm really pleased to be, be here today and I, I'm, I'm gonna pass the, the, the baton on to, to Fanny Martin. Taking this, thank you so much, Mark, and thank you, Rachel, for hosting this expert chat. Uh, I'm Fanny Martin. I am an expert of the general. I guess I really think of myself as a generalist. Uh, I work as a creative producer. Um, my company is called Art of Festivals, uh, and my general aim in life is to bring more arts into everyday life and more life into the art sector. Uh, I'm a also middle-aged uh, white woman with long brown hair. Um, I'm wearing a um, patterned uh, dress which has some orange, uh, blue, brown, white shapes onto it. Uh, the name of the fabric is called Barbican, which reminds me of my years in London. Uh, I'm currently in Toronto, Takaronto. Uh, and yes, I'm very happy to just be able to uh, unfold a little bit our various practices and think a bit uh, you know, about how we as an art sector can be more strategic, more intentional, uh, how we can prop each other up as well, because we all have strengths that we can, you know, develop that can really add to other people's practices, needs, etc. So how can we be truly more collaborative and offer what we have and continue to support each other in our ongoing journey uh, of learning? Oh, I love that, Fanny. Thank you so much. Um, today's chat, um, as Fanny has so greatly explained, we're going to talk about consulting practices, um, how to use existing tools or create your own. Um, really, this chat is meant to inspire any of you out there who are consultants or who want to be consultants, who want to expand your practice or perhaps set up your practice. Um, so thank you to our two amazing guests today. Uh, Mark, how did you start your journey as an independent consultant? Well, um, uh, I've been working as an independent consultant this time around for since 2010. And um, so that's tw nearly, nearly 12 years, it'll be 12 years in, in March, I think. Um, uh, uh, and I, that doesn't feel, that felt like sort of, I don't know whether it's halfway 
um, through the journey, certainly part way through the journey. Time will tell, won't it? <laughs> it might be the early years, who knows, um, in, um, in, in rather than mid period. Um, uh, but I, I had been working for the Arts Council of England, which is the, the national funding body, the equivalent of the Canada Council for the Arts, um, roughly um, speaking. Um, uh, for 10 years prior to that. And before that, I'd been working in, in community arts um, in Teesside, um, which is where I live. Um, uh, Teesside is um, a uh, historically an, a, a, an industrial um, part of, of, of England, um, uh, known for the chemical industry, um, particularly historically, um, at home. Uh, for a long, long time of uh, ICI, Imperial Chemical Industries, um, uh, in, 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 before that was broken up um, uh, as a company um, uh, in all sorts of ways, um, but also quite a, on the borders of a rural area as well, as well as the sea. So quite a mixed area. I'm not from here originally and moved here for my first professional job in the arts. Um, uh, which, which I only um, did when I was 28. So before that, I worked as a chef, uh, as a vegetarian chef and a head chef. Um, and, and in a way, I suppose I go all the way back to that, not just to tell you my life story, but because I think for me, being, running thinking practice has been part of the same journey that I was on then. Um, I was the first person in, in my family to go to university and I went and studied English and French and then much to the kind of surprise of my parents I became a vegetarian chef uh, after I left university um, but in a way that was that was me wanting to change the world I suppose to put it at its most at its grandest and most naive maybe um, uh, and I did that quite seriously you know very seriously for, for a number of years but I was also writing I'm a writer uh, uh, an editor and publisher, um, and started to think that I could um, uh, influence the world that way as well, and the hours were better um, uh, in the arts. Uh, and weirdly enough, the pay was better as well, which is sometimes people in the arts are surprised to learn that, but my pay went up when I left catering. Um, so I then had a kind of very, um, uh, uh, a kind of slightly wandering career, without ever moving house. <laughs> I haven't moved house in 30 years, that's stayed the same. Um, uh, but I did lots of jobs, um, trying to find the place where I could uh, do something really positive, learn things um, and earn some kind of living. And there were spells where I did all three and there were spells when I only did two out of three, I think, um, in, in that time. Uh, and I. I had worked for the Arts Council for 10 years and, and I was the, the head of the Arts Council in the north of England and part of the national team. So I was you know, quite senior in that. Um, and it was a job that I really liked um, uh, in all sorts of ways. But I came to feel that the sort of systemic issues that the sector was, that I was grappling with in that job, I could, not to say other people couldn't address them from those sorts of seats, but I couldn't to my own satisfaction. Um, and I needed to be out in the field. Um, and I, uh, I think my uh, skill set, when I looked at that, I thought, actually, I don't want to run another big organization. I want to work with organizations of all different scales. I want to work strategically, but also be hands-on with people because um, uh, I'm quite a hands-on sort of person. And when you become an executive director, often, People don't want your hands on things. <laughs> they tell you to get their hand, your hands off um, uh, when you try and do stuff. And I wanted to be a bit more hands on. Um, and so for me, consultancy was a way of doing that. Um, and you know, I've probably done three or four cycles within the twelve years I've been doing it of different pro you know main projects that I might have been working on at a time. Um, I worked with an organisation called Middle Mission Models Money. Um, which had some international influence in the first years. Um, and then I've done you know, all sorts of different things in that time. So for me, it's been about variety. Um, uh, but you know, I, always want, I, I, I always said when I left the Arts Council, I wanted three things. I wanted to um, make a difference. I wanted to get paid <laughs> uh, and I wanted to keep learning. Um, and that for me, consultancy has been quite a good way to do that. 
It's quite a journey from, from university to chef. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. Fanny, how about you? What's your story? It's interesting because there's, there's similarities and then huge differences. For example, I've moved houses probably about 20 times <clears throat> in 20 years because you know I, I grew up in a village in France, tiny village, no such thing as theater, opera, orchestra, all these things, none, none of it. But in France, we do have uh, this kind of commitment to cultural democracy. So it was easy to get, for example, music lessons. And uh, there was a dance studio in a village of 5,000 people. There was a dedicated dance studio that was literally across the road from me because it was a tiny village. So I did get a lot of practice, uh, artistic practice, I would say, in my early years, but not artistic exposure. Uh, so, I mean, I don't often share that, but the first concert I ever went to was probably when I got my first uh, proper job in the arts uh, at the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. And I thought, oh, I got the job. <laughs> I may as well go and check out a concert because, you know, I knew I knew I would love it. Uh, I had studied music, etc. But I, yeah, I didn't have this exposure. And so when people take access to big art things as uh, you know, like a measure of what we should be aiming for. I think, I don't know, because what was really formative for me in my early years was the, um, the parades, for example, that the village used to organize themselves, you know, with a lot of, with the floats, and then there was a night parade with like candle procession and things like that. Yeah, like uh, secular uh, festivals, essentially, but for, for people, by people, and that's the sort of thing that I really, re I really resonate with uh, in community art and it, a lot of participatory arts as well. Uh, so I had a kind of meanderous journey to get to wherever I am now uh, because I'm always trying something and then kind of the opposite <laughs> just to check. So I did very literary studies and then went to business school. Uh, just, just to have the skills so that I can actually do a budget because I, I always think I don't want to be limited. I, I want to know how the other people are working. Uh, and that's important to me. I'm a generalist, uh, but then I learn to work with people. I don't necessarily learn to become a specialist in one thing or another. But for example, I learn a lot about evaluation so that I can work very well with um, specialist evaluators. That's my goal. And then I can embed small evaluative um, techniques and principles as well. So that's been my journey into uh, how I learn and the jobs I took. Uh, but the longest profit job I ever had was this job at the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra, which was a 10 month uh, maternity cover. <laughs> So that's, yeah, I have a problem with hierarchy. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't sit with me, but I could also see right away, you know, what we were saying just uh, a few minutes ago about uh, continuing to learn. I could not feel that I was allowed to learn in that role. Like I remember at some points having a, a pang of anxiety because I was reading an article about arts marketing during my working hours. And I was actually wondering to myself, is this, is this okay? Am I going to be considered someone who is uh, working on, you know, on, on the employer's clock? Like, am I doing something for them, for me? Like, I was very confused and I couldn't ask them. Uh, there was no communication at that level. Uh, yeah, even to get professional development, you really had to beg for it and all that kind of stuff. And, and I thought, no, I can't, you know, I can't deal with this. So the, the way I've been dealing with my own learning was to just take different jobs uh, because, I mean, training on the job is probably one of the best ways. And then when you start looking into an area that you're not familiar with yet, like you're very curious about it. So you kind of absorb very quickly what is evaluation, for example. And uh, it, it, that, that just gave me that, um, yeah, it's like a, a going up like very wonky stairs, I guess. Uh, but I always try to, whatever I learn, I try to share it back. And that's what I'm trying to do now with this practice, you know, of being uh, both a creative producer. So I work with artists. Uh, right now I'm working with quite a few um, Canadian artists. So I can name them because uh, it's good to push them up as well. So Sonny Drake, who's a playwright. I'm working with Caddy desbiens Meules, who is a media artist. I'm working with Michael Gary Dean, who's a composer and media artist. 
and I'm working with Megan Oshi, who is a choreographer. And they all do very different things. And that's what I love about the way I've set up my practice is that I can work with really, you know, avant-garde, like uh, um, really driven artists who really want to make a difference in the world, but have very strong aesthetic um, um, principles and, uh, and uh, desires. And then I work with organizations uh, so, for example, right now I'm running um, a professional development program with working culture uh, for festival managers, uh, but I can bring everything I learned from being a producer. So, for example, everything I've learned from commissioning uh, artists or working with artists as a creative producer, I can bring that so that we can talk about the creative process and we can talk about what's a talent development scheme. And, you know, so I've, I've really tried to always be on both sides, like the it's kind, of, it's kind of left brain, right brain, I guess. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, trying to smooth things out and open the, the, the barriers that we kind of put between, oh, this is creative, this is business. It's like, well, I think we, we can be flexible. We can be fluid in that sense. And this is how also we're going to break down all these systemic uh, barriers, like the way that we borrow so much uh, what's the polite word, bad things, uh, from management uh, techniques, like the proper managerial world, you know, all the acronyms we use, all that stuff, we don't need it. We really don't need it. Uh, they just add some jargon and some uh, barriers to what we're trying to achieve. So there you go, that's my manifesto, no more acronyms. I love that. I'm, I'm okay with that. I think we can get rid of acronyms. Um, so I'm actually just going to pick up a little on something you both said was about learning. And I feel like that really brought me to where I am today. Um, I seem to have a seven year limit. Don't tell. Uh, maybe seven years at one job, seven years at the next. Um, and, uh, and I think for me, it gives me the amount of time I need to learn from the organization or from the people involved. Um, so I, I worked at a, a very large, um, no, I worked at Roy Thompson and Massey Hall. So I worked with international artists coming in from everywhere, um, everything from opera to rock to pop. Um, and it was amazing. And I, I learned you know, the proper ways to deal with a high-end artist backstage and all of that. Um, and then I went on to, I left the arts for a while and I worked in social services and autism services, creating events and programs for kids with autism and their families. Um, and I left that after seven years and I just sort of had fallen in to doing relaxed performances a couple of years before I left, like here and there. Um, I worked with Soul Pepper um, and the Young Center. They were my first sort of clients. And, and then I moved on to the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, National Ballet, um, and then all the way down to the Brockville Theatre Guild, you know, a city of 30,000 people, their theatre guild, you know, working with them. Um, because I realized, like you said, barriers, you talked about management barriers and, and actually something, Fanny, that you brought to my attention very unknowingly to yourself, I believe, couple of years, or I guess maybe a couple of years ago now, was um, the universal, Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is that every person has the right to participate in the arts. And that really struck me. And, and I wanted to, I, I've always believed strongly that every human has a right to see themselves represented in our media. And I was realizing that we have a community of disabled people that are not getting that. There, there's so many barriers for them. And, and that's sort of what led me to consulting. I went to the UK and studied with um, the originators of immersive theater, Oily Cart. Um, uh, and, uh, and I went to New York at the Lincoln Center and I studied there under a bunch of companies and came back and had the extreme pleasure of meeting other people doing the same work and and kind of you know everyone talks about finding your people and and it was like a an awakening for me and um it really became something that i wanted to do and i'm very grateful that you know spark encourages that they encourage all of us um staff and board members and members to to expand yourself and expand your horizons and really um do what it is in the arts 
that you want to do and to share that with other people. Hence the reason why we have expert chats, right? So thank you for both of you sharing your stories. I, I really appreciate that. And I think our members will as well. Um, Mark, let's talk about your book for a minute. Tactics for the Tightrope. Great, thank you. That's the, the sentence every writer dreams of hearing. Um, uh, so yeah, last year during one of the lockdowns in the UK, um, I was trying to get to sleep uh, and failing uh, and and thought, uh, came back, my brain came back to an idea I've had over the years that I should put some of the things that I have written um, together. Because um, being a, a consultant gives you lots of opportunity um, to think about interesting things and in my case to write about them, but not necessarily in, in a logical order. So you look back over 10 years and you kind of want to reshape them. Um, uh, and I've been working with a network called Future Art Centres, um, uh, which is a network of over 100 art centres in communities across the UK. Um, uh, and the kinds of things that I wanted to write about were exactly their interests. And uh, so I kind of pitched this idea to them and uh, uh, and, and they said yes, which was which was nice. I don't think they quite realised what they got themselves into, but um, uh, so it came out last summer. Uh, it's called Tactics for the Tightrope, as you said, and you know that the idea of the well, the, the tightrope is an image of both the beauty and the precarity of what we try and do in the cultural sector. I think you know it's it's not about an image of a single person, but of a, of all sorts of people on the on different type ropes, jumping from one to another, helping each other, catching each other if we fall uh, or when we fall, because we will fall. Um, uh, some people just watching, some people admiring, some people looking between their fingers because they're too scared. Um, uh, and the tactics is because I don't think there's a, it's not a how-to book. Um, it's, a, it's a book of approaches and frameworks and, and I suppose, meditations and tools um, that might be useful to some people to do what they want to do. So it's not a kind of how to succeed in the arts in 20 easy lessons um, uh, or anything like that, partly because I'm not interested in dictating to other people what they should do in the arts. Beyond some notion, core notions for me of, around equity, and um, uh, fairness and justice and change within our societies, what kind of things I think we need, we need more difference, not anyone telling, you know, we must have this school. Um, you know, I perhaps in my, in my 20s and 30s when I edited the poetry magazine, I was a bit more interested in going, we should write this sort of poetry and not that sort of poetry. Um, but I'm, I, I'm less interested in that now really. Um, um, uh, so I've tried to pull together lots of different things, partly around organizations and individuals and how you can survive and be resilient and creative uh, in, in, in the arts, um, partly about community, um, drawing on a lot of work that I've, I've, I've looked at, mainly in the UK, but some international work as well, um, uh, around creative, creativity in, in communities. You know, a lot of which chimes very much with what Fanny was describing about, you know, her 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 roots in in in, in the village in, in in France. You know, communities that might be seen as far from concert halls and orchestras have culture, have their own um, rituals and rites and, uh, and 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 pathways and so on. Um, so I tried to pull it all together. Um, uh, Listening to all, all our introductions earlier, I was reminded of a, of a word that I use a lot in the book, um, which is bricoleur, bricolage, that notion uh, which comes from, for me, uh, alongside tactics um, from uh, Michel de Certeau, um, of tr using what's at hand um, and a very um, diverse range of interests generalist in some ways but but also 
um, kind of putting those tools together in different ways, you know, perhaps using the tool for the purpose it wasn't designed, but seeing what, what you can do with it. That's always sort of been my approach um, in, 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 in culture. Um, so I've, I've put together a lot of tools that people can use and, and they can adapt and they can go, well, actually that bit doesn't work for me, you know, and we've I, we published it under a Creative Commons because again, that's a key principle for me of working as an independent consultant is this is not how, this is not about how I extract value from the ecosystem. It's about how I can help that ecosystem share some of the things that might make it work and might make it more equitable um uh, for me so all the tools are um uh you know the whole book is creative commons that people can adapt it um although the the beautiful hard copy um is uh you have to pay for there is a digital version which is available free um on the future art centers website so people can download that because we didn't want to exclude um people who might who might otherwise you know, not access that or indeed um you know people uh, uh, around the world for whom um, you know, the, the, even the ordering of a book from the UK. We, we're, we're making it very difficult in the UK at the moment to, to buy things from us in, 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 in all sorts of ways. So, so we wanted it to, to be a bit more accessible. So yeah, so that's, that, that's, that's what we did uh, for a lot of last year. It was a much bigger, inevitably, it was a much bigger job than my brain thought that night when I was trying to get to sleep. But that's those are the tricks your brain plays on you, aren't they? When when it has an idea. So we look at a couple of tools, Mark, just as a as an interlude. Yeah, I can, can I can share, share those screen. just just to give an example. Um, let me. So this is one. You know, some of these are tools that I've generated, and some of them are ones that um, I, I I've kind of borrowed um, from elsewhere. Let me just share this screen. Um, so this this one, um, ikigai, which is uh, it comes from Japan, Japanese culture, um, and and for, but for me has been a really useful thing, both as an individual and it's useful when I'm working with individuals, you know, individual artists perhaps, um, or creatives who are trying to. Get the right balance in their lives and their practice um uh, but actually i've also used it quite well with organizations i was doing this just the other day actually um asking you know what's uh, asking these questions about an organization so i came across this in some work around um uh, as a particular part of japan where people live to a very old age um very healthily um, and part of the research some of the research suggests it's because they're very good at, at, at finding this um Ikigai, which is the heart of this thing. And basically it's, it's you ask yourselves four questions. Um, you can start anywhere, but what do you love doing? Um, what are you good at? Might not be the same as what you love. You might love something, but you're not necessarily the best at it. You might be good at something and not necessarily love it. Um, what can you get paid for or raise money for in the context of, of, of the arts perhaps? And what does the world need? You know, and that might be your particular world, you know, locally or in a particular group or um, uh, uh, community. Um, and working through those questions, honestly, can firstly can help people design how what their business might be um, if they do, if they're at that stage. Or also, it can be useful for kind of understanding perhaps sometimes why they feel the way they do in their practice. Um, so, you know, a kind of a common one, I suppose, for artists is they might be doing what they love and they might be really brilliant at it. And there might, you know, even be um, uh, a need in the world, but there's just no money in it. <laughs> They're not paying the bills. Um, uh, or able to pay the bills. And I've been in that situation. I tell a story in the book about coming back from holiday and emptying a lot, opening a lot of letters from the bank when I was working as a poet, bouncing checks, which tells you how long ago it was. But, um, uh, you know, I wasn't getting paid enough for the things I was doing that I loved and I was pretty good at. Um, so I was operating in the passion zone then. 
but I realized that actually I couldn't, um, because of the circumstances of my family, um, I couldn't just operate in the passion zone. I needed to get somewhere in where it was more of a profession as well, or maybe even more of a vocation. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, that was one of the points where I changed. So for me, this is a, a you know four simple questions, simple but deep questions, um, uh, uh, and it leads can help with analysis. And then it also um, often leads to three questions that I, I I use a lot in my practice when I'm working with people, and that a lot of these tools are really finished with, which is okay, you've had to think about those four questions. What are you going to carry on doing? What are you going to stop doing? Um, and what should you start doing? You know, those three questions in themselves are a little tool in some ways. Um, you know, I think those are really good questions for the end of an evaluation process, for instance. Okay, we've had an interesting chat reflecting on last year's festival. What should we, what should we start doing, stop doing, carry on doing? Because um, it, is, it, it should lead to, it should be practical. I suppose that's what, 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 what I'd say about any of these tools. So yeah, so that's, that's one of those tools. I don't know whether it, either of you have ever tried that in, in, in your work. I haven't, but I'm yeah. really drawn to the question of what are you going to stop doing? I, I talk a lot about relaxing processes and taking the time to do things. Um, and, and that idea of what you're going to stop doing really resonates with me. What about you, Fanny? I use the stop, stop, continue in a facilitation uh, format recently, and it was introduced by someone else. So this is where, you know, this community of practice becomes really important. Mm. So I was part of um, a co-creating team, like we co-created a methodology for a uh, an in-person workshop it was in november it's like oh my god I, I didn't remember how thrilling it was to be with i think it was 120 mm -hmm. people and we had small groups but we did cobble together a lot of tools and thought about you know what what works what also um can be used you know in this bricolage uh kind of uh spirits you know what can we introduce that look it's a spoon it's a fork and you know you can find different ways to use your uh, your spork for example you can combine them <laughs> uh, but all of this i find this is what we find in that uh, profession uh, side of your uh, ikigai diagram and that's one thing that's really important to me at the moment the question of peerness and how we develop it mm -hmm. how we cultivate it um in french the word carrière or ca career in english carrière uh, in french means quarry and it's something that we dig, you know, it's something that you work at. It's something that uh, you kind of nest in, I guess, you know, that, that you know, we talked about um, our mm -hmm. uh, work cycles, you know, the, the, the meandering kind of ways, that's the career that we are tracing uh, for ourselves. And I find that uh, cultivating this with other people around you, we all have our different ways to start and to go somewhere, but we have so much to share. And yeah, I love to take the time to have reflective, uh, just reflective dialogue in that sense. Maybe I can share a tool mm. that I just made up. Yes, because I'm trying to learn to use it. <laughs> so this is really typically something that um, I have created and I am learning to use. And that's quite interesting. Uh, um, okay, just pause because I need to uh, pull it up. Oh, there it is. Ta -da. So this is a tool called State of Emergence that I came at uh, again through a meandering way. I think the story doesn't really matter. But the idea is to get into uh, systems thinking. Really, this is a cycle. It's a pattern. And it's something that can be found uh, at the micro level. So for example, even the course of our conversation you know, we, we started with what we're going to talk about, and then now we're going into tools, you know, which is uh, a choice and et cetera. So we can find things at the micro level and then, uh, you know, in a fractal way, this pattern is also, for example, a cycle of growth and maturity and what happens, you know. Um, so I made it with questions as well, because I love the power of questions and a very well-crafted question. So I have things like this. What does starting feel like for you? 
And so I've used this uh, with a couple of artists so far. And when we start working together and we really have a conversation about actually starting, what does that mean to you? What does it feel like? What are the patterns that are coming back you know, when you're at the start of a project? And then we go into exploration. And here the question is, what does learning feel like for you? And for me, this stage is about accumulating tools or charting your journey, preparing for your journey. So what do we need to learn? What do we want to learn as part of this journey? Then we have the navigation, which is you know, going on the open sea. That's for me the collaborative side, because we need to find this. Um, you know, this balance between uh, finding a shared interest, finding shared purpose, uh, there will be conflict arising, how are we going to, uh, you know, deal with uh, divergence, because that's very important. So let's not, uh, let's not assume that consensus is the goal, because that can actually be quite placating. Uh, let's be open and let's discuss what does collaboration mean for us? Do we have a goal? Do we have a way to assess, uh, you know, our emotional well-being as part of this, uh, of this um, shared journey. Uh, the transformation side of things, this is evaluation for me, and that's kind of my big uh, cheval de bataille. I, I bring it back all the time. Uh, I'm actually, yeah, very excited about evaluation uh, always, and I think it should be embedded into everything we do, but at, you know, the roots of what it is, it is critical reflection. And it's this practice really of being like, oh, hold on, where am I in the journey or in the group or in my life? Or, you know, what does this mean? And it's just to have this constant loop you know, on yourself and that takes you somewhere else. So you're constantly processing, this is the fact, you know, this is what I observe and this is what I make out of it. And there's the kind of sliding motion is how I feel in the evaluation should be understood, not just the reports at the end of the project. And then with emergence, uh, this went into a harvest mode uh, because I think celebrating is something that we are at danger of forgetting to, to do for ourselves and for others. So how do we celebrate? How do we actually mark the end of a project, for example? How do we say, yeah, yeah, this was good, this did something, instead of going super quickly to the next one and not having you know, the, the, the enjoyment you know, of having done something together. And so this is why learning, critical reflection, uh, starting, you know, all of this blend together and you can bring them like super tight. They're, they're, it, this is a way of unfolding essentially. So if we are to quote uh, French philosophers, uh, Marc, I will quote Gilles Deleuze, and the notion of unfolding and the folds, the pli, and always thinking, you know, what, what can you take a bit more time to, to look inside? And there's something hidden there, you know, in the corner, in the shadow. And actually, that's the treasure often. That's the thing that uh, we are creating. It's the value we create. But Again, to bring back my, uh, you know, uh, kind of resistance uh, uh, against managerial uh, practices. Like, if we are profit-driven, if we have selected evaluation criteria or uh, you know uh, assessment criteria that are basically uh, merely based on money or numbers, then we forget about all the rest. We don't see it. So this is the kind of stuff I'm trying to work on. I think that's really interesting that because I was thinking as you were talking about that tool that I suspect what we one of the things that our approaches have in common is is, is the sort of the roots in purpose and identity and that experience that that you were talking through with that that tool um, rather than managerial concepts like either profit or even return on investment social investment social return on investment um and those those sorts of um uh things that for me you know i've written a lot about resilience and and, and can talk about that um if if, if 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 it's helpful but you know for 
for, for lots of people, they've applied that very narrowly in a managerial sense, um, financially, generally, talking about diversification of income, et cetera, more than reach of their purpose. And for me, you know, what I've, what I've learned over the years that I've been working with that idea of creative resilience is it's purpose that matters the most. You know, within within the limits of solvency, <laughs> legal solvency, um, it's purpose that's the heart of it, not your not your trading. Okay, so we're going to move on a little, and I'm very interested to know how do independent consultants work? How do you do your work? How do you work with people? Mark, would you like to start us off? Um. Uh, yeah, I immediately um, uh, think of the word various, things being various, as the poet Louis Mitney said. Um, it, 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 I try and work in a very bespoke way. Um, and I suppose one of the things I should say, and I think it perhaps connects to things we were talking about earlier, is that um, thinking practice is, is me, essentially. Um, uh, Mark Robinson isn't a very good name in England to be found in a Google search because it's very common. Um, uh, so I needed a company name. So it's me essentially, but I don't just work on my own. And, and I think stepping outside of a big organization as, as I did, and you know, we've all worked in, in those for some length of time anyway, you know, it isn't, it can be quite lonely, but it doesn't have to be and being independent. So I think there's a thing of you get to pick which gangs you want to be in at certain times for, for certain fights, maybe, <laughs> certain situations. So, I, I, you know, I've probably got two or three sets of people that I work with on, uh, on an extended basis. And, and I, I personally haven't gone down that road of, you know, us each calling each other our associates and trying to look bigger than we are. So life's too short for that for me. I just can't be bothered. Um, uh, and I don't want to give people the wrong impression either, actually. Um, but sometimes that's a strategic choice that people make to look bigger than they are. Um, so for me, it's very various. And sometimes I'll work with other people and bring them in if I don't feel like when I have a conversation with people. Um, so it is about getting to know people in their situation a little. Um, I, I think when I started, I did the kind of classic tendering for jobs um, and that sort of a situation. You're very much at least starting with some uh, something that you've pitched against, some set of deliverables, some set of expectations. But those are always sort of to be negotiated in every sense of the word negotiate. So negotiate as in agree, but also moved around, um, uh, not tripped over and so on. Because um, I think my experience is if you, if you just keep going back to the brief, going back to the original brief can be really helpful when you get, what am I supposed to be doing here? What did this person say they, or this group of people say they wanted? Um, let's go back to the brief, that can be helpful. Um, but equally, if all you ever do every time you hit a tricky issue or a question or a dilemma is what's my deliverable, that can turn very uh, mechanistic for both the client and for you. Um, so for me, it's about establishing a relationship, um, establishing what the real need is, what the real interest and what their commitment to the project is. Um, and I think over the last, probably the last five years, you know, I've, I've kind of got a pattern where I have, um, the way I think of them is sort of um, short, fat projects <laughs> that might be quite intensive for a period of month, for, you know, two or three months, and longer projects, which might be a day, a month, or three years, um, or, you know, less than that even, actually, um, and somewhat something in between. Um, and what I've tried to do is to get the balance between those things right, because there's a, there's, a, there's a budget implication of that kind of structure. Um, uh, but there's also an attention budget. You know, I, I, I like to think it, 
time and attention have budgets to them as well. <laughs> um, and, and if you've got too many itsy bitsy projects, if I have too many itsy bitsy projects, let's put it like that, I can get very, um, uh, well, I don't know what the right word is, distracted. I suppose it's hard to, to, to get, and, and that's, that doesn't feel comfortable because I like to feel I'm giving the attention to the thing I'm giving attention to. Even if I've got five different things that week, it, they all get the right attention. So that, and, but I need to understand the relationship with the client to know what the attention should be, I suppose. So it starts with that. If you're working with a consultant, you have to be honest with yourself about why you're employing a consultant. Some, you know, some, and maybe it was, uh, you, you, either of you've got experience with this, but sometimes people go to consultants when they're a bit stuck in whatever, you know, either because they need a particular kind of expertise or they just need somebody else to think through what, what they and their board have got stuck on. Um, but maybe they don't really need a consultant. <laughs> maybe they just need somebody to come in the room and go have another think or reframe it and present the questions to them differently um, and I think that's the key thing that consultants do but it also feeds into that common mistrust of people who call themselves consultants which is you know I'm trying to think what's the, the old joke that you know you ask a consultant the time and they borrow your watch and then charge you for telling you what time it is um, uh, which is clearly unfair, but there's also an element of truth that often I find you go in and people actually knew what they needed to do. They just haven't quite got over the line of knowing that they knew. <laughs> Can we go Mark into uh, like, I'm thinking this, we say consultants, but then sometimes we're facilitators and sometimes mm -hmm. we're mediators. And sometimes, let's say a board will try to get an external person in because they have a conflict that they cannot resolve and they can't even name. But you may, this is the frustrating bit that I find personally in that kind of work sometimes, is that it's not being made clear. Like they kind of still hire you under the guise of you are going to move the needle. But in fact, yeah. it's more about naming the problem, the problem and they're not even ready to move the needle essentially and so mm -hmm. there's a lot of questions of scoping and the role yeah. that you play precisely and this is i mean uh, you know if, if we can go into how would we like to work with uh, clients partners collaborators etc for me there's like a lot of clarification and really mm -hmm. honest um uh, conversation that i would love to happen more uh, at the beginning of uh, of a project and i find that when i do things like obviously uh you know more like learning program design mm -hmm. you know professional development kind of you know, sector intervention or what i'm thinking of uh, as strategic production mm -hmm. so it's really in motion you know it's not consulting but it is sector level uh, you know if we think of consulting as more like a business thing mm -hmm. and I find it, it, it much easier to speak with my partners, my clients, whoever yeah. about what do, you, what do we want? And, and it becomes a we as well, because I'm part of the sector in that sense. I come in as a creative producer, you know, I'm, I'm invested. But the consultant's mm -hmm. role, it is useful sometimes, it is necessary sometimes, but maybe sometimes it, it really is a researcher. You know, mm -hmm. when you, you stay a little bit surface level and you, you are, you know, looking at observing, uh, you know, in a kind of uh, critical manner. And then there are maybe several degrees of intervention and coming closer to the circles. But I think this clarification is, uh, is really essential to set the expectations right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think, um, I think the things that I've enjoyed most have been those long-term things where you're able to kind of get the best of both of the both the closeness and the distance that consultancy brings we use that word and, and it's not a word i use very often because I, I much more use a specific word depending on the jobs so whether it's coaching facilitation you know mentoring research um or just writing <laughs> um uh but one of the that sometimes that where you get, I found the role of critical friend 
as a, as a job title, um, which I don't have, uh, I don't give myself a job title um, uh, generally, but where you've got that on a long-term basis, I found you're able to, I, I, I've been, we, we, the people I've worked with in that role, have been able to get the best of having the ongoing thing, relationships, somebody who really knows you and your situation and is in touch regularly and deeply, but equally isn't part of the team every, every week. So has some different perspective and freshness and ways of framing things and ways of uh, playing things back. Um, and it's all, you know, I found that to be actually a really cost effective thing as well, actually, much more cost effective than letting things get to the stage where you need to bring somebody in for a bigger thing um, and, and build skills in the team. I mean, that's that's the other thing I try and do is leave the skills, leave the tools behind <laughs> when you work, when I work with somebody. Um, that's and maybe just rather just... than get them hooked on working with you. Just a word about critical friend because it's not so much used in Canada. Uh, in the U okay. No, in the UK, like it's, for example, uh, creative people in places, which we'll drop a link to um, mm. in the comments uh, somewhere. Uh, use critical friends a lot. Do you want to okay. say a little bit more about what it yeah, is? Yeah, well, I suppose what that what what that's been has been, and and it can take all different sorts of roles, but it's somebody who is. It's, a, it's a, firstly to say it should be a long-standing relationship. Um, it's somebody that you can talk to outside the organization about issues within the organization, um, whether that be in the team, you know, and it's, it's not necessarily, you know, the connection isn't always at the top of the organization. It might be with the team um, uh, within it. So it's not, it's not a kind of chief exec's privilege to have a critical friend, although often it is. Um, uh, so having that outside so you can have a, a create a safe space for reflection, I suppose that's the, the, the key thing. Um, often it's about um, uh, the articulate, I, I think it can be most helpful in helping people really articulate their ambition and then how they're going to keep track and on the progress of it. So it's it's quite related to coaching in in some models, really. I think, um, uh, yeah, and you know that label, the critical friend label, is is just that. It's a, it's it's a label um, that gets gets put on it. But what I like about it is it's a little but regular, um, and that seems to have proved really valuable to people and you know from other critical friends as well I'm not just talking about working with me I really like that I I've never heard that phrase before I really like it when I'm working with a company that I work with over and over again I consider myself a gentle guide and cheerleader <laughs> which I yes. feel is maybe the same thing like yeah, yeah, very similar. yeah we've got this we're gonna do it um and, but also there to to listen um frequently and and you know I have people that will just email me and say, what about this idea? And it's like, yeah, great. So we may not be working on a specific project, um, but we're there. So I guess maybe mm. I'm a critical friend to some people. Wow, very cool. Yeah. You could probably put your rates up by 5% if you call it that. <laughs> <laughs> if so you want. What, what advice could we give to an organization or someone within an organization who wants to you know, identifies, who identifies a need for a consultant of sorts, as we said, there's various roles to be played. What would be a good way to set up the relationship right from the start? And I'm gonna start with my tip is, tell me how much money you actually have to spend. And I'm very amenable and actually I prefer to work in phases. So I prefer to work, let's have phase one, which is scoping, which is, you know, and that's gonna be, just a few days not too much and then we really um then figure out what the next steps are what are your tips rachel and mark oh wow that's a big question um i like to know for me it's generally show or project based right like we're working on a specific performance so i want to know what you have and also what you don't have so what can you offer and what are the points that you, like, where's the hard line? Like, no, we can't, 
we can't do that. We don't, again, we don't have the budget or we don't have the person power. So I think that's a big one for me because then I'm not saying, hey, let's do this, 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 and this. I'm working within, we're being creative within the confines of what that project can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mine relates to that. And it'd be something around being frank about your non-negotiables. Um, whether it's a financial non-negotiable, that that's how much money we've got and we couldn't, it can't extend it, if it, even if it gets more complicated, or, you know, these are the small p political non-negotiables in this situation. Um, and, you know, that one I, I find is really important if you're, if you're asking for assistance with thinking something through, um, which sometimes people, you know, what do we do about our IT system if you're working with an IT consultant or, you know, which building should we move our venue into out of these three things, you know, that kinds of um, options appraisal things, you know, it's, it's never helpful to have the uh, unwritten non-negotiable <laughs> um, that that has to come out so you know comes out later in the process um you know we understand that perhaps sometimes in big p political situations not everything can be written down but you know be as frank as you possibly can about the situation um uh, and I, I don't mean that in a negative sense even it's just going this is what we're about so don't come and tell us that we've got to be something different um, you know, to, to use a sort of stereotypical, um, you know, consultancy example of the consultant coming in and telling you, actually, you ought to be a very different business. I don't do that, but some you know, other consultants are available. So that's a good question. Um, you know, when someone asks you to do something that isn't within your practice, like, how do we, how do we deal with that? Or how do we come to that with the client? Fanny? So hmm, that's interesting because I'm, I'm really just starting to um, work in a collaborative way with, with collaborators, associates. And yeah, like Mark was saying before, it's maybe a way to make my practice look a bit bigger. But the way I think of it is like a pirate ship, hmm. you know, and sometimes I can uh, steer it on my own and sometimes uh, I bring people on board. But I really try to bring people who have a vested interest. So we share the bounty, essentially. Uh, so I ideally I would bring people on board around the start. I would design the, pro the project with them. I don't I do not want to work in a hierarchical um, situation with people like I work at peer level that's my luxury in some ways you know to be able to uh, to do this in my own working life uh, so that's yeah I, I would bid for a project or make a proposal with people already in mind uh, saying this person is uh, an expert in accessible marketing for example this person is an expert in international touring uh, and then they would be part of the of the bids so yeah that's how we'd work mm. it yeah that's how i like to work it that's still work in progress for me and um i think it's one of the exciting thing about being able to check by like, change the shape as well of the team and the relationships and then every time i meet you know new mm. peers professional friends i always think ah, what, what can we do together yeah. <laughs> so i do also make up projects in my head based on who i want to work with that's definitely true yes yeah I mean, I think it's similar. I, I, I wasn't sure when you questioned, Rachel, whether you were getting at the kind of ethics as well of, of, of practice. Um, I mean, I, I, I have two sorts of responses to your question. One, one is to do with practice, which you know, is very similar, in a way similar to, 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 to what Fanny just said. I mean, I, I think I like that idea of the, the pirate ship um, with, a, with, a, with a few dinghies around it, perhaps, as well. But, um, uh, the, and that's how it's often how I, I, I work. I think there's also something that I sometimes seek out the project that feels slightly out of my comfort zone that I know I'm going to have to learn something to deliver really well. Um, um, yeah, I, can't, I, I wouldn't want to, I don't want to work there all the time, but having something that I'm doing actually 
I'm pretty sure I can do this, but I'm going to have to really, really concentrate and learn some new stuff that I want one of, I want some of those in the mix every year. Um, the ethics thing where you can, and it's not happened to me very often, but you know, sometimes you can think, oh, am I being brought in here as a consultant, as some sort of tool and shield or something? And I think you just have to kind of train your radar to be alert as early as possible to that. So, that you, and then, and then, you know, um, either, you know, my, my, my approach to that these days is, is, is to deal with it fairly head on. Um, but that's probably because I'm more in a position to do that than I would have been 20, 25 years ago, earlier in my career. Um, uh, and also I think, I don't get approached to do that very often either. <laughs> Hopefully people, well, they, they either don't think I won't do it or won't be very good at it. Um, uh, so, but I think you, you have to develop your own ethics as a consultant. And, you know, it's quite an important um, component of it, I suppose. Yeah, I, I agree. And I love the pirate ship too. So, you know, there are times um, working in accessibility where I am not the person. I I am I am not blind. I I don't know how to respond to that or you know um so I try to include as many people as I can and and I have sort of I guess my go-to people and my community consultants that can help with that. So it's very interesting. So what about like strategic planning as as a as a independent consultant? Like how how does that work? Do you have one? Do you make one up? What do you think? Do you mean for yourself or as a practice to do it for organizations? So for yourself, how do um, you plan for the future or do you? Yes, <laughs> I think you have to. And I mean, Mark was talking earlier of uh, this mix of short term intensive kind of tactical projects and then the longer term, you know, and I think that's it's all a balance. And I see my practice as the, the balance point, you know, the kind of gravity point or whatever it is as shifting and my I can shift it with my own intentions, if you know what I mean, like, for example, <laughs> I have mentioned that I moved about 20 times uh, so far, I will move again, right? So I'm always planning, my work needs to fit my lifestyle. It's a bit like the, you know, I'm going where the weather suits my clothes. Uh, why am I in Canada? <laughs> why am I in Toronto? Yeah, that's, that's not a Canadian <laughs> song, is it? No. So yes, so there, there is always more movement uh, in the works and I want to learn as well. So that is always a uh, part of um, my big plan personally is to think who can I work with and this stretch that Mark was mentioning, like what what's the project that's going to make me learn a little bit more, that challenge me a little bit more and always playing with these things that like going back to the Ikigai, things I know I can do very well and things I'm very passionate about and I'm you know, completely learning. And that's when I may bring in an expert or take a course uh, specifically for it. So I invest a lot in my own learning. I pay for a lot of courses um, and I spend time and I read lots of books and uh, there's all of that that is happening in the background. But I, I, I do have a plan. Not sure I can explain it very well. Uh, I'm doing a, hopefully doing a PhD starting next year, which is going to add you know, a layer of research and reflection to all of this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I encourage people to really think of what, what do you want? How, how can your work fit your lifestyle? Like, I like to read books. How can I, you know, kind of make a living somehow? How can reading books be part of my working day? How can I not relegate these so-called hobbies uh, into the background? I'll give one creative example of this. Uh, at some point, so I played music when I was uh, much younger. I played the piano. I wanted to be a piano teacher. Uh, and then I realized I hate children. Um, so that was not going to work. Uh, so I stopped playing the piano, you know, life takes over, like I went to university, etc. And then I started working in uh, musical education. So I was working with music educators. And I actually, actually started a project um, at a, a UK conservatoire. I was the research coordinator for a big project about how do adults learn to sing? 
how do adults who are terrified of singing or non-singers, as you know, we call them, how, how, what is their learning journey? And then I realized I need to be a learner. I, I, need to be a, I need to relate. And I think that's true with a lot of participatory practices at large. Like if you shun all creative activity for yourself, if you, if you don't engage yourself in this beginner uh, process or this amateur process, you're not really well positioned to tell other people that they should be knitting and drawing and singing and stuff. So I started the cello. Uh, when I was in London, I started playing the cello and I see it as totally part of my work. And during my working day, I might do a few scales because it's very relaxing and, uh, you know, it helps me connect with my, you know, uh, inner uh, musician and my creativity. And it's just a different way. And like it, all of this for me, it's all valid. And I really wish that, um, you know, people at large would really uh, embrace these practices as something that is not profit indexed but there is so much value coming from it so that's mm -hmm. my kind of longish answer to say um i try to make my work fit with my life desires mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting i think you know in 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 a, in a different way i think that's probably what i've done as well um i think there's there's something around that the image of the tightrope of tactics for the tightrope from the from the title of the book is 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 i settled on partly because the tightrope's an image of stability and change at the same time it's a it's a it's a paradox you know i'm not even sure it's about balance actually i'm sure it's about the paradox of you have to keep moving and you have to keep still <laughs> and yeah, I have to stop and you have to go all at the same time. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to paradoxes as a poetic device, I suppose. But um, uh, that, I think, for me, I, I, I can, I can uh, echo a lot of what, what Fanny said about, you know, why I work as a consultant rather than in an organisation. Um, uh, And I also take time out during the day. You can see in the corner, there's a guitar. Um, uh, when I hear that, I, I, my house is next to a school. When I hear the kids in the playground, I think I should stop for 10 minutes like them. And I stop and play the guitar for 10 minutes. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I've answered. I'm not sure I answered your question, Rachel. <laughs> no, no, you did, you did. I so, couldn't remember what it was I by know. the end of I know. So we're coming kind of close to the end. Um, and there's something that, you know, I'm going to bring up. Um, and uh, I want to tie it back to our members. So we are rural and remote arts practitioners, artists, mm -hmm. presenters, uh, community animators. So that person in the community who's on every committee and makes things happen. Those are the people we love. So how do we build mutually supportive lasting relationships like as a consultant how, how how do we do that mark any tips um well i have a tool that might be useful maybe i could share that um uh, 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 I'll, I'll give a bit of context for for, for this um uh, this i did some research um which isn't about consultants, but is about developing relationships and communities. Um, so in, in England over the last nine years, it's been a, a really significant intervention by the Arts Council of England called Creative People and Places, um, uh, which basically took a different approach to funding the arts than um, we've traditionally taken in this, in this country. Um, uh, and it focused on areas where all the statistics showed that cultural engagement was lowest. And it put the money into community decision making um, as opposed to, and this is a slight false picture, but as opposed to finding the best work and giving those artists and organizations all the money and hoping that they'd reach everybody eventually. Um, a parody slightly, but um, only slightly. <laughs> um, the, so the so this has 
done a lot of work in often quite deprived communities or usually quite deprived communities because there's such a correlation between uh, in England at least between um, social deprivation, educational attainment and engagement in the arts. Um, uh, some of them were semi-rural communities um, there. Obviously, the English version of rural is slightly different than you have over in Canada, um, you know, in that you go from one end of our country and you're just been over to see your neighbour in Canada, I know that. But um, uh, so it, it's been very much about community development, but it take, they had to take a different approach to leadership within those communities and artistic leadership than the traditional artistic leadership, which has been quite hierarchical, um, quite um, heroic figure led, you know, the, the theatre director, the artistic director, the conductor, you know, all of those sorts of images that we have from our very traditional art forms. Um, uh, they had to sort of break those down because in some ways those are part of the problem of cultural engagement. Um, and they came, I, I looked at this and I came up with a, a, um, a, a framework, I suppose you'd call it, um, of how CPP has changed a lot of those dynamics su uh, successfully, um, which I boiled down to three words, connect, collaborate, and multiply. Um, so this, there's a chapter in the book about this, but there's also a report on the Creative People and Places website um, which looks at, looks at this. Um, uh, and it starts with connect, it starts with understanding what you know about place, about the people in it and yourselves and the context, um, asking people what they want, what they need. And that might not be, um, you know, one of the key things that Creative People and Places did was it stopped asking the question, what art would you like? You know, it stopped going to these communities and going, oh, you don't seem to have very much art. What would you like? Here's my brochure. Um, and going, well, what do you need here? What do you do here? What have you got? Have you got a community center? Do you do parades? If you do parades, have they got brass bands in them? You know, all starting from a different starting point and connecting people up um, through those questions. Um, and then it encouraged those people to collaborate. So, you know, I mean, I suppose the three of us is, an, is a little example of this. Um, I think I met Fanny when she was working on a project for uh, someone in the UK. Um, and, then we met, and then, you know, she introduced us, uh, you, you, Rachel, and we, we're, we're doing this. Um, so connect and collaborate and then multiply, which is about really multiplying those connections. So once those connections start going, they can, um, uh, the phrase go viral has been slightly tainted, hasn't it, in recent years, but um, they can spread very quickly um, and they can multiply. And that's really key to inclusion. Because if you multiply in a community, you suddenly start to reach to the people who perhaps aren't part of the usual gang that would turn up to the community hall um, on a Tuesday night. Um, uh, so that for me has been really important in thinking about that, that kind of question. And I think it you know, absolutely applies in, in rural areas from work I've done previously. Yeah, that's amazing. That is exactly how Spark started. Um, and that is what our aim is, that we are a peer-to-peer -peer network, connecting people, learning and growing and sharing. I mean, these are these are the words that we put on our call out. So we've just put mm -hmm. out we've just put out our call out for workshop proposals for our symposium in October. And we want to know what what you, our members out there, know, what you want to share. Um, what is it that you are an expert about? And, and also that leads us to our expert chats, you know, don't be afraid out there to, to say, hey, Rachel. You know, I, I want to talk about um, this amazing uh, dance piece, including fire dancers that we did. Great. Our whole community wants to hear that. And then that might spark in somebody else the idea to do that in their community. And then they start collaborating. And that leads to the, the multiplying, right? Um, mm -hmm. We have another uh, program running in partnership with Ontario Presents. And 
and the Community Presenters Network, which is the Presenters Exchange Program. It's not a mentoring program. It's a chance for presenters in different areas of the province. So I'm really good at X and you're really good at Y. Let's spend a day learning Y and then come to me and spend a day learning X. You know, I, I love that idea and that is definitely what we're all about so it's it's really great to hear that that's happening in the uk and and you know maybe one day we can connect our our network with those networks right um fanny what about you well i want to uh, maybe we're coming to a close and to end with this invitation really to um meet for nothing uh because it you don't know i i hate this sentence actually because it's so um uh uh, kind of used, but you don't know what you don't know, uh, and especially you, it's difficult sometimes for for an individual or an organization to really appraise what they know uh, if they're not confronted with someone else who doesn't know what they know. So I mean, I'm the worst uh, for this. I really take everything I do for granted, especially the, for example, my event management skills like I, I i think that's for me like of course i can do giant festivals everybody can do it right you know and we all have these this kind of uh blinkers thinking oh well if i can do it or if i know that you know surely that's just common knowledge and in fact it's when you really interact with other people in a genuinely curious you know and um open way that you realize that oh okay i know a bit more about this or I have done a bit more research about this or you know like we also need to shift this notion of knowledge and what it means because some it's not about an object the knowledge is not a fixed you know quantity it's something that is constantly moving and sometimes what you know i mean especially i think the beauty and the value of the arts you know the way we work is that our, our real knowledge is of process and the tools mm -hmm. we're sharing, you know, uh, throughout here, like it's about knowing where you are in the process, knowing how to, you know, how to pace also your process. Um, I think a lot of um, the affective states, you know, that we find ourselves in throughout the process. So for some people, the start of a project is anxiety inducing. And for some people, it's really exciting and, you know, it's the best thing they know on earth, etc. And if we open up about this, we realize that, oh, OK, I'm anxious about starting project. You're really excited. So you can start by leading. And then when it comes to doing the, you know, crunching the numbers, oh, I'm good at that. And, you know, so it's only by really talking on a, on a human level, you know, like what, what are your joys and what are your avoidances? And then we can find where we really uh, match, you know, and where we can really fit uh, with each other to, to do these great projects that really uh, are not going to get anywhere if we don't collaborate super openly, generously. Like there's no such thing for me as intellectual property when it comes to all these tools that we're sharing, because a lot of them, like Mark was saying, it's borrowed and, you know, adapted and updated for um, our reality. But, I don't think anyone is inventing anything <laughs> at all in general, you know, we're just recycling in a, you know, in a constantly inventive kind of way. And so this is why having open conversations, uh, there's something that we uh, hinted at before as well, this idea of co-coaching, uh, like, you know, you don't, you, you could pay for a critical friend, but you can also be each mm. other's critical friend. And you can say, let's meet every first Monday and you tell me about your projects and I tell you about my projects. And, you know, with the accumulation of time, you develop uh, a knowledge of your own uh, processes, fears, avoidances, joys, et cetera. And you support someone else in giving them um, this, this listening platform, which is so important. Who's going to listen, you know, if we're not ready to, ourselves to listen to others then how can we expect others to listen to us i think there's something in everything that you just said there that reminded me and i can't remember quite what the french phrase you used was but that that the the farmers of culture kind mm -hmm. of idea and um, you know that which connects to the rural communities that that you're working in 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 in, in rachel or you know not in exclusively farming communities obviously but you know with that in there and and almost a sort of 
you know, it made, when you were talking earlier, it made me think of, of, of the, the writer Wendell Berry and, and the things that he's written about farming and the connection between certain ways of farming and culture that get blown out by the, 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 the kind of big industrial um, approaches to, 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 to agriculture, that that thing of sharing tools <laughs> that people will do, sharing expertise, sharing knowledge, sharing weather forecasts, <laughs> um, you know, all of that stuff, um, which is sort of built into many rural communities. You know, I, I did some work years ago when I was at Arts Council on rural touring, which, you know, and you're involved in. And, you know, those are really great examples of, of, of that kind of culture making, culture sharing, um, and the way that culture plays into everyday life, really, I suppose, in, in those, you know, the people who fill the village halls for rural touring in England are not necessarily going to the big theatres. But actually, they're not just going to the theatre, they're seeing all their neighbours. And that has a connection, that does something else, that connects and collaborates and multiplies all their aspects of their lives as well. Um, and, and if you don't get that, as we don't in many urban areas, then you get the issues that arise with, in the absence of those things, I think. Yeah, there is something very special about um, going to the community hall or the local pub if you're my village is not big enough to have a pub but if you're lucky enough to live in a village it's big enough to have a pub um and seeing your neighbor on stage and being there to support them and then next week they're there to support you um and you know to go back to that sort of farming thing it it's it's like a seed exchange right like we're exchanging these little seeds of creativity mm -hmm with each other, which then allows us to collaborate. So yeah. this has been great. Um, what a wonderful hour of conversation. Thank you so much. Um, Mark, I'm wondering if there's something you'd like to leave us with today. Well, maybe, maybe this is a connection, maybe I can connect this back to the farming analogies as well, really. But one of the, one of the ideas that I conclude the book with is that if we want resilience, we need some slack, both for ourselves as individuals, um, uh, within our organizations, not to always be at 110%, uh, within our communities, not, and, you know, not to be at 110%. And you know, maybe there's some connection to that idea of um, uh, you know, allowing, allowing land to be fallow within the cycles of, 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 of agriculture there, rather than using chemicals to, 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 to blitz it one all of the time. It's, it's hard to do. Um, and when I was proofreading the book at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning before getting a day's work done, um, I, 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 I laughed every time. Well, I laughed ironically every time I came across it. But for me, it's one of the big challenges. It's not just in the cultural sector, of course. You know, it's a broader societal um, issue um but to create that where you can whether that's in time savings um just not being at 110 percent all the time um for me that's the heart of creative well, one of the key things in creative resilience as well as that purpose and it's actually also part of community because i suspect and you know this is talking from you know my own experience in, in England which might be very different from people watching but part of the fraying of community life those sorts of um, festivals and marches and so on that, that that Fanny mentioned and you know I remember similar things from 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 from, from, from my ch childhood even earlier in, in, in the places where I grew up people are too busy to do that a lot of people feel too busy to do those things now. Um, uh, and that's not a healthy thing as well. So we, so keep some slack for yourself and for the system um, uh, would, is one of my kind of, uh, well, it's a note to myself as much as to anybody else. That's so a good one to end on. Thank you for that. I really appreciate yeah. it. So yeah. thanks, Mark. Thanks, Fanny. It's been wonderful having you both today. We really appreciate it. Um, if anybody has any questions, you know, you can 
email me um, uh, at rachel at sparkperformingarts.com and I will pass them along and we'll get back to you. Um, obviously we've veered away from our live tonight just so that uh, Mark wasn't up at in the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> um, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you so much for taking the time with us today and uh, thank you for joining us and watching our presentation and we will see you next time. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.